Hey. Oh my goodness. I am so happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you beautiful people on with us today. Hi, Dee. I see you showing all your teeth in your gums. You must be in a great mood. I'm always in a great mood when I'm here in this space with you and also our wonderful guests who are uh, blacky, black, black, black. I love when we are bringing black joy to the camera. Uh, we bring the relief to the lives of people. So this is great. I'm always glad to be in this space for sure. Fantastic. And we do have a guest speaker, which I'll be happy to introduce. But I do want to say just a quick hi. Is it Zomo? Can I call you Zomo? That's you can call me Zomo. Yes, that's, that's fine. Well, I, <laughs> I love your hair. You're giving us a look. Mm, well, yeah. hello. Wait, 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 hello. I just finally get it because you know I'm slow. Zomo, Zomore. I get this is too cute. <laughs> I, need to, I need to be in that. I got to figure out my name for it. I love it. Zomo, that's. It's all a mix, uh, mix match of just different names spliced together. That's what it is. I love it. Well, DC, well, D'Angelo is DC in DC. I'm B, her, mm -hmm. and then Zomo. So I love it. We've love got it. Cute little T-shirts. T-shirts. Yes, <laughs> for sure. Well, hello, every beautiful body out there. For those who are not familiar, my name is Blair G. Hervey. I am the founder and CEO of The Corporate Strategist, and I'm joined by my colorful co-host, my bestie and soul friend of 20 plus years, D'Angelo Crane. Say hello. I love these frames, sir. Hello. Thank you. I got these from a uh, black owned business called, I think it's Richie New York, maybe Richie Rich New York, but check them out on Instagram. That's where I ordered them from and got some real glasses put in them because I can't see some real lenses put in them, I should say. I, I have to tell you, Blair, I've just decided to remember the video that you started one day early when I was fixing my hair. So now I've just decided whatever my hair is going to do is what it's going to do because you're not going to catch me again. So my hair is doing whatever it's going to do today because I'm just like, it is what it is. It's natural. So you never know what it's going to feel like a do on any given day. So you just go with the way it feels, with the what, what your hair says to you for that day. And today it says, I'm all over the place, but I'm here. I'm present. It's giving Killmonger. And a very big welcome, everyone, to our guest, Grow with Zomo or Zo more. We're so excited to have you. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm loving this sibling. Y'all are giving me so much life right now because I love the joy that you're putting into this. And I just got all kinds of backstories floating in my head. I love it. Well, hopefully we can hear about them. I'd love oh, to tell sure. embarrassing stories. About I'm an open them. book. <laughs> well, before we really get into the topic and all of the great things about uh, Zoe today, D'Angelo, you have something for us, sir? You already know this. What we do every day here on the Black Diva Collective LinkedIn Live Podcast, our Facebook, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, we always uh, really ask our guests, how are they doing, how are they feeling? It's the art of the check-in, which we're asking leaders to do each and every day. If you want to really uh, build empathy and vulnerability within your team is to really go deeper and ask those questions that are not just purpose level. So Zoe, we're going to start with you. How are you doing today? How's your soul, your mind, your heart? How are you feeling? I'm in a good place. I'm in a good place to be, um, to go forth for the rest of the year. I think I've been taking this first quarter and maybe the first month of the quarter, second quarter, slowly focusing on my house. And I'm in a good place and energized for the remainder of the year. Oh, I love that. I love that. And Blair Hervey, how's your heart, your mind, your soul today? How's your aura? I am super fantastic. Again, the only thing that's bothering me, I would say I have these two lashes, lash extensions left on this left eye here. But other than that, I mean, you know, God is good. I can't complain. Hallelujah. How are you, D'Angelo? I'm good, but you had the same issue yesterday. You need to call her makeup and have them do a little boom, 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 boom on you, whatever it is. Okay, do you want me to send somebody over? I'm sure I got somebody in Portland. I'll send someone over to do a little boom, 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 pow. Yeah, I, I, I have a girl. I have a girl. I have an appointment. But how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I am. I'm uh, excellent today. I have no complaints. It's a little chilly here in DC. It's been in the 50s all week and rainy, and we're like, where is mm. the springtime weather? Please give it to us. So, uh, other than the gloomy days here, I'm doing fantastic. Okay. We'll take that. We'll take that. Well, welcome again to you, Zoe, and thank you for joining mm -hmm. us for this valuable converse conversation, particularly such last minute. We met yesterday. Mm -hmm. This conversation is too good. We got to keep it going with my bestie, and here you are. And for those who are not familiar with Zoe, of course, I want to call Zoe Zoe. It is Zoe. Zoe. Yes. Zoe. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's a whole acronym. Zone of energy. So in my high school days, I used to do spoken word. Okay. Shout out to Erica Badu. I you got the head wrap. I had the natural. And this yeah. is my weave today, but you know. Um, yeah. Spoken word at a burrito spot. Used to do it frequently. Okay. Guy walks up to me and he said, you know, I love being in your zone of energy. I'm going to call you Zoe. And I was like, my name is. Uh, and he walked away and walked out of my life. 
And then somebody asked me my name and I said, oh, it's Zoe. And they were like, not Zoe. And I was like, no, it's, it's Zoe. And it stuck for the last 25 years. So. Oh, I love that story. Yeah, I'm full of them, full of stories. What you want to hear? <laughs> I think we're going to hear it all today. But for those who are not familiar with Zomo, Zoe is a consultant, a facilitator, a course instructor and speaker, also mm -hmm. an army veteran. Thank you for your service. My pleasure. And also a self-proclaimed doerpreneur. I had to say that about three times. I was like, yes, doerpreneur. She's very skilled at inclusive event management, consulting, speaking, and writing on topics of equity, diversity, and inclusion strategy strategy, particularly in the hospitality, meetings, events, and tourism industries. She's mm -hmm. also a strategic EDI consultant for more consulting agency and affectionately known as Grow with Zomo. So again, welcome, welcome, welcome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Now, today we're talking all about, you know, the journey from um, going from side hustle to solopreneur. And I know you have some other ideas to go along with that topic as well. You brought this to the virtual desk of TBDC. But before you tell us about that topic, tell us a little bit more about, you know, what was that defining moment for you to actually get into this Diva work? Like we call it here. You know, I um, I got out of the army trying to figure out what was next. I was in school to get, you know, a master's in hospitality, recreation and tourism, went to an association called Meeting Professionals International. And at the time I was living in Oakland, California. So while in Oakland, California, I'm going to all these amazing events by grassroots organizers and just event planners, different conferences and things like that. And this association was across the bridge in San Francisco. And it was predominantly white. And I just saw a disconnect between the event planners that I supported and loved with the association and industry and wanted to bridge that gap, literally, you know, across the bridge. Here we are less than 40 minutes away. And I just wanted event planners that look like me, that think like me to have access to those resources so they could scale their business and have, you know, access to uh, just different sponsorships, venues, and just knowledge about how the industry worked. And so I started speaking about, uh, you know, developing an inclusion uh, and diversity committee. And it was the first of its kind. And I did that for two years at a local chapter. And that pushed me into the global spotlight for the, the industry and, and did that for two years. Um, and that led to awards, covers of magazines, and, and really talking about the importance of DEI, specifically in hospitality events and tourism. And so that was a defining moment, is just seeing something and saying, yeah, it needs to change. And I'm going to be the one that's going to lead that effort and connect with other people who have been speaking about this. Ooh, I love that. You didn't tell me all this yesterday from <laughs> grassroots opportunities to, you know, accolades. Um, mm -hmm. You're definitely a disruptor. So I'm excited to learn more. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, you know, the, the, the accolades, I always say it, it's great. You know, that's, that's fine and dandy, but if the work's not being done, if it's not, you know, measurable and sustainable, and my biggest thing, even this year, as we talk about it some more is, you know, I spent last year doing all kinds of speaking engagements and, and, you know, lots of different rooms and all that kind of stuff. But in the end, if the impact is not made and felt by black and brown businesses, then, you know, I, there's more that I want to do. There's more local impact that I want to make. So when, when DC came on and, and immediately shouted out the black owned businesses that he purchased his frames for, I'm like, yes, like, how can we invest in that business? And what does that business need? What kind of events and marketing do they need? That's where my interest is. Love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm excited about today's topic as well, because I definitely love supporting Black-owned businesses as much as I can. Um, you know, Madam C.J. Walker, who's one of the one of the early uh, significant uh, Black-owned business leaders mm -hmm. that we know of, right, who the first Black woman to have earned a million dollars, she said, I had to make my own living, my own opportunity, but I made it. Don't sit down and wait for opportunities to come. Get up and make them. And when we think about from the journey to side hustle to solopreneur, it takes you getting up every day, putting in the effort, mm -hmm. putting in the gumption, uh, being a confident, taking risks to make this thing happen, right? Right now we're seeing that uh, in a really boom when you think about black entrepreneurs. Uh, in 2022, there was 1.2 million black entrepreneurs and over 2 million small black businesses in America that's happening. So we see it's happening. We know how much revenue they're bringing in. So this is a really important topic as people are shifting 
from traditional roles in corporate America to owning their own destiny, owning their own financial wealth with going into entrepreneurship. So I'm excited about today's conversation. So let's just start from the basic one on one. I love this, this, you have, you're calling yourself a strategic disruptor. Mm -hmm. let's talk about what does it mean to be a strategic disruptor and how is that needed when you think about being a solopreneur? What, what, are the, what are the attributes of a strategic disruptor and how does it help you be successful in going into business for yourself or with yourself? Absolutely. I mean, you know, when I think about strategy, you know, it comes from my time in the military being mission oriented, right? In order to achieve a mission, you have to understand the goal and then the steps it takes to get to that goal. And so I took that learning over 12 years, two tours in Iraq and brought it into my civilian life and realized here's a problem ahead of us. There is a disconnect between black and brown event professionals and the commercial or corporate industry that is predominantly white. And so what does it look like? What are the resources that are needed? What is the education that's needed? And there was a lot of noise in the space. There's a lot of what I call righteous anger. People are you know, shouting at the top of the hills at the top of their you know, voices about what's going on. But then in the end, when you ask, what do you need? What are the resources? What are the steps to get there? They're kind of like, uh, that's not for me to figure out. Well, for me, I apply strategy to it. If I need you know, more capital for these businesses, what does it look like for us? What does the presentation looks like? You know, if I need um, placement or you know, marketing, what does that look like? And so each area that there is a, an opportunity, what, is, what are the steps required to get there? And so for the difference for me is that I, I definitely hear everybody that has that righteous anger, but I wanna put strategy towards it so that my mom used to always say, Cross your T's, dot your I's. So when somebody tries to turn you down, if you've crossed your T's and dotted your I's, then they're only turning you down because they're being discriminatory, racist, or, or, or things like that. And be able to prove it with that clear strategy that you've drawn out and laid out so that in the end, it can be you know, measurable and sustainable and replicable by somebody else who wants to follow your path. So it's all about strategy and that applies to DEI, applies to business, it, it applies to my life, you know, just really thinking strategically about the goals that I have ahead and what I want to focus on. So as a solopreneur, it's necessary because, you know, I have to schedule my naps in there as much as I do how often I work, right? There has to be a balance. It's, um, I don't necessarily say work-life balance, I more say work-life integration, um, but my health mentally and physically is just as important as the goals financially that I'm trying to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know, I, we've had this conversation. <laughs> yes, I kind of agree with you. Yes. No, and yes. And. Like, uh -huh. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, you know, rest is definitely important, but going back to what you said before, um, when it comes to that strategy and helping those organizations think about, you know, what is it that they're needing? Um, and you mentioned capital. Mm -hmm. We talked about this very briefly yesterday as well, but I want to encourage organizations to make sure that they're paying us what we're worth, not paying us what we say, you know, what we send over in the invoice, which of course that, that makes sense. But if you're mm -hmm. going to pay, you know, a white male speaker mm -hmm. X amount mm -hmm. of dollars, make sure that you're play, paying a black woman veteran mm -hmm. speaker, you know, that and or more um, in a lot of different cases. Absolutely. So that was just a thought. But the other thought that came to mind was, and I may have shared this story with D'Angelo before, um, but I used to work for several tech companies. We'll just say that. But there was one tech company that I worked for uh, most recently. And when I went to a sales kickoff, I saw this tall, dark skin, beautiful woman with long locks and a honey body was everything. Suit was everything. And I felt so inspired. She spoke about, you know, strategy or whatever the topic was. But then another black woman came on stage and I was like, wow, like I really felt mm. represented in that moment. So when I think about the work that you do, when I think about the work that my friend Karen Foster of KF Curates does with events to make sure that they are centering equity, how do you make sure that you make these moments of representation um, really real and not just a moment? Ooh, I love that question. And, and the simple answer to me is that that representation has to connect to outcomes, right? So outcomes towards more mentorship um, and opening more doors for those who are not in the room. 
Um, and also making sure that that person who's being represented on stage, that their business is amplified so that it's not just a one off. Like you can miss me with just, OK, I put this person a tokenism. I put this person on stage and that's the end of it. I want to see them integrated into the remainder of the year and for years to come. I want to make sure that I can connect with them and, and seek out opportunities to collaborate with them. And so it has to be in alignment with, you know, again, sustainable goals. Like, how will this be uh, carried forward? And I want to be involved in that and, and also get that opportunity because doors are now open. Come on, strategy. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> All day. All, I mean, is you know, like, I, I do this, like, I love analogies. I love metaphors. And, you know, sometimes the word strategy can feel a little convoluted, where it's like, oh, you know, I'm not a strategist. Sis, you, 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 bruh, and you, you both, all of us, we strategize every single day. When you say, I want this meal, I want some oxtail and some rice and peas, you have to go to the refrigerator, open the refrigerator, see what ingredients you have. And if you don't have the ingredients, you got to go to the grocery store, you got to order on Instacart, you got to break it down in steps. You have to look at the recipe to get to those oxtails and rice and peas. And so that's a strategy. So let's, let's simplify it real quick that it's not something that is out of your touch. You just got to figure out what your goal is and then determine what those, you know, different ingredients are going to be. That was a great analogy because TikTok has made every recipe easy for me, but that's another topic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to, I need to, to call cookbooks, you know that, right? A little cookbook that we had back in the day. Listen, we need sometimes we need smaller chunks of knowledge. Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes we need a step by step situation. Sometimes I need, you know, a, a chocolate man who's walking me through that exercise. I, but, off. but anyway, you know, that I need the last one. I need the last one. I, need, uh, I don't need to cook. I don't need to get the ingredients. I need him. I just need to watch. I hear that's, you. I'm feeling like really objectified right now, but okay. <laughs> oh, oh, Jesus. Like like. Close your ears. Close your ears. Right, exactly, Close your ears. Exactly. <laughs> So, uh, Zomo, we think about, um, you know, I have dabbled in event planning myself and I, I just it wasn't the field that was uh, that I love to do every day of my life. Right. And so now I, just, I love the fact that I can just do it just on my leisure and do it when I want it to be fun and, and all that good stuff. But tell me about how does a black event planner go from being the black event planner that all the black people go to, to really diversifying their clientele and moving into more uh, other spaces, right? But also both and as we're talking about this, is it okay to lean into being a fantastic black event planner or, or you know, wherever it may be? So talk to me a little bit about both sides of that coin. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, there are, mm, we, we don't ask this question to white people. I, I'll start there. <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, if you're an event planner, you're an event planner. It's a skill set that you have. You have a logistics background. You have patience, troubleshooting. You have all the skills. And know the color of your skin should not change who your clients are because that's a skill set that is needed. Everybody thinks that they can throw a birthday party or a wedding, but when they get into the details, they cannot because they don't have those skills. Um, however, when you get into um, the, the, the work that a Black event planner does and the clients that they choose or the clients that select them is because I'm going to show more care because I care about the event that you're, you're putting up. So working for the MBK Alliance and My Brother's Keeper, Obama's uh, Foundation Alliance. Um, I'm going to care about more of those Black boys inside of that event and make sure it's the best experience ever for them as, uh, you know, honorees and for the attendees that come because I have a Black son and I'm a Black mother. So my care and my concern and th that environment that I create is going to be different than it is for any other event planner of other social identities, right? And so that's where it matters. But how does an event planner who is Black uh, step outside of just creating events that are focused on the Black community? Um, you have to talk to like Andrew Roby, you know, Andrew Roby events, Mahogany Jones, who do that successfully both, you know, across the U.S. and in Canada, where, again, they just show up them be their best selves. They are great at what they do. They know how to build a team. They understand it. design, execution, and strategy. It's always going to come back to strategy. These are amazing people. I don't do events every day. I just support event planners getting the platform that they need. And what I find is that they just have that skill set. And so 
it, it, your your event planner needs to align with your your expressed and strategic commitment to DEI. And those are the individuals that you want to choose is that they're going to create an environment and experience that is inclusive. That's the goal. I like that. You know, um, we had a good conversation yesterday with Stacy Brooks and Stacy shared some things about, you know, his experience and his journey from um, working in corporate America to becoming an entrepreneur himself. And then I thought about um, my journey as well. You know, the things that were necessary for me to um, not only cultivate the skills, but cultivate the confidence to, to take that leap of faith. And I used to be very offended, honestly, when my leader would say, oh, so how's, you know, your little side business going or <laughs> your side hustle? I'm like, it's a whole company, you know, mm. it's a whole business I'm over here grooming. Um, and what I realized from that moment, much like uh, a call that I had earlier, a woman asked me, she was just like, so what's the magic in what you do? And at first I was just like, girl, ain't no magic in what I do. But once we start really thinking about the skills that we develop, the niche that we develop, just like Stacey said yesterday, and much like what you're talking about as well, Zoe, we, we do um, develop this magic of mm -hmm. our own, uh, black girl magic, if you will, but magic in its, in its essence. What would you describe as your magic? What's your differenti differentiating factor, in other words? Mm, the phrase hashtag or saying diplomatic empathy comes to mind. Okay. Uh, oh, he pulled back on yes, the camera yeah. real quick. I'm like, talk to me more about it. I'm loving it. <laughs> Diplomatic. I love it. Come on now. Ooh, uh, you know, working in a DEI space or around multiple people, there's a there's an anger that just sits in the center of your chest where, you know, it's just like that feeling like when you get out of a movie, uh, that, that that Black center that's telling our history. You just feel angry at the world. But you know that that anger expressed in, in environments will not make will not make progress. And so you are a diplomat. You have to show up in spaces where you're you're willing to hear and listen to some thoughts that people may share with you um, and have empathy for their their ignorance, empathy for their their lack of exposure um, about social identities, about being marginalized, about the harm that has been caused to marginalized identities. Um, and and be able to educate in a way that they're going to understand or um, be curious, you know, influenced to be curious and e explore their understanding or critically think about their lack of understanding. So to have diplomatic empathy is how do I respond to this question without punching you in the face? That, that, I mean, in so many words. And, and it's, <laughs> I just, I... That's just real talk. Like it's, it, it, to, to, to think that any person who is marginalized for whatever social identity you are representing in a room does not feel some kind of way when they're answering these questions is, you know, not, it, it, it doesn't happen. People feel they have emotions. The emotional labor to get into this work is always going to be there. But to have, again, that diplomatic empathy is, is the way that I engage with people who want to learn from me. And I want to support your learning so that you can treat me and mine better. Hmm. Let me let me dive into that just a little bit deeper, just mm -hmm. so if anyone's out there, they're just like, yeah, I would love to hire Zomo, but I, <laughs> I'd love to have a clear understanding of what's different from her strategies than others. Mm -hmm. if, if you could um, put the nail in the head about one thing, what what is your one thing that's different about you and your services? Yeah, you know, kind of following off of that diplomatic empathy, I think it's the way that I educate. You know, I have a course that I teach, Event DEI Strategists. There's a lot of people, you know, engage in the discussion forum and they have a lot of aha moments mm. because I've used analogies. I've used things that they can relate to or resonate with. And in, in addition to that, I use, you know, different frameworks that have been helpful for them. So I've, I've taken the SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, opportunities and threat. And because I like everything to relate to growth, I call it the grow analysis. What do you want to gain? What are your risks? What are the opportunities? What are the weaknesses? And I find that frameworks, just like the SMART you know, framework, helps you uh, stay guided on what you're trying to achieve. Again, what is that roadmap to the outcomes? And so it's here's the problem. You know, The problem is that you have power and privilege and access to resources that those who are marginalized do not. Here's how you can leverage that power Power, that privilege, that position to help more people um, who are either in your chain of command 
always in the army, either in your chain of command and in your, your responsibility to achieve, you know, to get upward mobility, to get access to capital. This is what you can do. Here are the steps, one, two, and three. And that helps a lot of people who are new to this information, maybe feel overwhelmed by all the atrocities that have taken place over generations, and then focus in on what they can do with, you know, their resources that they have that others are not privy to. And so educating people in that way, using frameworks, using strategy, making it clear, um, and, and giving them some takeaways, some best practices that they can use, I think has been the differentiator. That it, it's not just, here are all the problems, and then now what? And so really giving them a roadmap. That's helpful, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2020, 2020 and 2021, a lot of businesses started investing in Black businesses in because we, as responding to all the things that were happening in the world. When we think about the murder of George Floyd and racial trauma, and they said, we need to do better at this, right? Companies that are still doing it, when we look at um, media companies and TV and television, they're really continuing to invest in this, while other, while other organizations and other businesses, maybe not so much. So as a takeaway, what are the three top reasons that people should be continuing to invest in Black businesses? Why is this important? Why should we be talking about this? And why people should be putting their money behind Black businesses and Black entrepreneurs? Oh, so many reasons. And you just want three. Um, <laughs> we ain't going nowhere. We ain't going nowhere. And we ain't going nowhere. Those are all <laughs> my three reasons. I mean, you know, you, th you think about, um, there's an organization, MMGY, that worked with Nomadness Travel Tribe, um, Avita Robinson, on a study about Black buying power. And so when you think about our buying power, our influence across every single industry, um, when you think about just our creativity and innovation, those are the three reasons why you should continue to invest. Uh, dare I say it, uh, you know, a group of people who have been resilient. It, we have proven over and over again that no matter the barriers ahead, that the way that we show up, no matter how tired, no matter how triggered and harmed, we still produce over and over again. And we just, we add just an oomph that does not exist in a lot of places to anything. I mean, anything that we touch, I mean, it doesn't just turn to gold. It turns to all kinds of just, I, I'm sure you have a word for it, DC, that I don't. It's just magic. It, it's it just, is, it is. just magical. Every, I mean, from every sport to every type of genre of music. I mean, we can pop up in country. We can top up in classical, whatever. We are just, we have a magic that that is needed everywhere. And we ain't going nowhere. Like that. There's a Jagged Edge song. Uh, Y'all remember that song? Put a little. My little man, man. Man. <laughs> Meet me at the altar. We no, might. No. <laughs> That's not the song. Uh, not, Zoe knew what I was talking about. That is not we the song. Be, what song you think oh, of? Put a little oomph in it. Yeah, oh, I yeah. knew that one. I thought you was. I went someplace else. Well, what are you talking about? Marriage. It's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad that we was. We was jamming together. Uh, I just want to say this really quickly, though. Like you, you've given some great pointers, um, some great things for for folks to think about and for them to do. One that you mentioned yesterday that really stuck with me is about collaboration. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about you know getting these really big contracts, um, I don't know if you all remember this. Someone told me about this, but there was this big contract that a black woman received. Um, from the government. It was like the biggest, it was like a million dollar contract a long time ago. I don't know if it was a vent or not, but she wasn't able to um, deliver on that contract. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the circumstances were, but when I think about the things you mentioned yesterday, and it's a great opportunity to start collaborating with people who um, are more focused or have expertise and in intersectionality or accessibility or whatever the case may be, we can come together, we can get this coin together mm -hmm. and we can get this back together and you can get back to your nap. I thought that that was <laughs> fantastic <laughs> advice for our DEI practitioners out there. Collaborate mm -hmm. more. I'm yeah. sure I that. Yeah, I um another, you know, side hustle that I have within my my solopreneur journey is being a resource evangelist. I like to build a list of people that I can just amplify what they do. I like being that person when somebody says, you know, I need somebody in DC that does this and I know how to recommend that person. And when I reach out to that person, that person will be like, oh, Zoe's sending me an opportunity. It's gonna be a good one, you know. Um 
And so constantly building my, my network, which they say is your net worth, right? And so when you have that, that network of people that a project comes up, realizing that you don't have the capacity, um, you don't have the, that, that subject matter expert, you know, skill set or whatever, and knowing that you can reach into your network and say, hey, I, got, I wanna break off a piece of this pie because we can get all of this together. I think that's just important. It's just the way that I move. I'm always about an alliance of people working together. Love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, D, we're right about time, but I just have one quick rapid fire question, if that's okay. I have one too. Let's see what yours is. Go. Okay. Maybe you think good thing. Fair food, funnel cakes or corn dogs? Oh, neither. <laughs> <laughs> what do you get at the fair? <laughs> um, uh, the corn, the elote. Oh, okay. that's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay. So, well, because we do our research around her on um, the Black Diva Collective, uh, Atlanta or Oakland? Ooh, Oakland. Sorry, I just I'm I'm here in Atlanta, but I love me some Oakland, and I miss every single one of y'all. Y'all know who y'all are. Eight <laughs> on down. That was a good question, D. Uh, back mm -hmm. to you for a shout out before we close it out. Thank you, Zoe. Oh, Thank my pleasure. You. Uh, shout out to one of my favorite event, not event, experience curators, Fitz Fitzgerald, who's doing amazing things in Louisville, Kentucky. He's having an event, a big brunch event for Derby. Check it out. And he's actually going to be on the show. Uh, I've talked to him about being booked on the show. So he's going to come here and share with us. So check him out, Fitz Fitzgerald on Facebook, uh, a wonderful experience curator out there. All right, back to you, Blair. Oh, that got me super excited. Zomo, you are amazing. We appreciate your time, your energy, your look, your magic, and all the things you had to offer today. Um, and thank you again for being available at such short notice. Pleasure. Speaking of short notice, for everyone that is either watching this replay or watching us live, we will be here tomorrow, 12 p.m. Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and every single weekday to give you a little dose of Diva with D and B. Y'all have a wonderful afternoon, and we will see y'all tomorrow. Thank you.